Hello, good afternoon. I am Liz McGinley, a partner in the New York office of Bracewell. Welcome to our program on the future of CCUS projects. We have a great program for you today with a number of experts in the world of CCUS who will speak to you today not just about the rules applicable to CCUS projects, but also speaking from their practical experience, having been closely involved in a number of CCUS projects for clients over the course of the last year. Speakers today will include myself speaking about the federal income tax credits available for CCUS projects. Then we'll turn to Jeff Homestead, who will address some of the very important EPA permitting rules around CCUS projects and his experience with those for clients. Then we will turn to J.J. McAnally and Austin Lee, who will talk about land rights issues associated with CCUS projects. And then Patrick Johnson will talk about some of the issues that have come up in his projects around developing contracts for CCUS projects. And then finally, Brad Chin will talk about important IP issues that have come up in the course of CCUS projects in which he has been involved. So as I said, I will start talking about the federal income tax credits that are available under Section 45Q for carbon capture, utilization, and storage projects. I'll talk a little bit about the rules themselves, but we've covered those in prior programs that are available through the Bracewell website on CCUS. So I'm also going to talk a little bit about our practical experience and issues that have come up on actual projects for our clients and, cli and clients and projects that we have been involved in. So first, let me just start, uh, for those of you uh, who are not as familiar with the credits, give you a little bit of an overview of what these credits are and who is eligible to receive the credits. First, credits, unlike deductions, offer a dollar-for-dollar dollar reduction in a taxpayer's cash tax liability if they qualify for the credits. The amount of the credits available for CCUS projects under Section 45Q um, are based on the amount of carbon oxide that a taxpayer captures, and then uh, one of three things occurs. The CO2 captured is placed in secure geological storage. It is used as an injectant in oil or gas recovery, often referred to as EOR or it's utilized for a permitted purpose. Um, those purposes are not limited, they're still evolving, but very generally it's when the CO2 is converted through a process into a, a compound or a product where the carbon oxide is securely stored and prevented from escaping into the atmosphere. What has been the leader uh, in CCUS projects and the most common early stage CCUS projects has been the capture of industrial source CO2 which is then placed in secure geological storage. So that is most of what we are seeing in this first stage of CCUS projects and the real discussion is evolving as to whether emitters that are capturing the CO2 want to develop their own storage facilities for the CO2, so develop their own secure geological storage, or whether they want to rely on a third party that is providing secure geological services to them. So a lot of the issues that have come up around the credits and availability of the credits and utilization of the credits have arisen in that context of clients evaluating their options of creating their own storage facility or relying on a third party's storage services. So how much are the credits that are available? Well, they are based on the metric tons of carbon oxide captured and the applicable rate. The applicable rate for the credits is broken down into two categories. One, if the CO2 captured is stored in secure geological storage, and in that context, the credits increase each year up until 2026, reaching a maximum credit 
per metric ton of carbon oxide captured and stored in secure geological storage of $50 per metric ton. In the alternative, if that CO2 captured was used as a tertiary injectant for oil or gas recovery or utilized for one of those permitted purposes that I just spoke about, the maximum credit achieved in 2026 is $35 per metric ton. So you can see um, from those two categories that the credit for CO2 that is stored in secure geological storage is much higher. It's, it's up to more than 40% higher than if the CO2 is used for EOR or a permitted purpose of utilization. So that's another reason that uh, emitters are being drawn to storing their CO2 in secure geological storage because it earns them the higher credit. Just to illustrate that, if we had a project where 500,000 metric tons of carbon oxide were captured each year at a facility that was placed in service in 2026, the taxpayer that is capturing the CO2 could could earn as much as $300 million of credits if that CO2 is stored in secure geological storage. In comparison, if that CO2 captured was used in an EOR project or utilized for permitted purpose, the credit would only be $210 million over the uh, life of that project. So you can see that big difference really kind of driving emitters capturing their CO2 to want to store their CO2 for the higher credit. Also, I want to point out as we're getting closer and closer to 2026, when these credits um, are maximized at either $50 per metric ton or $35 per metric ton, there is more and more attention paid to the annual increase after 2026, which is based on an inflation factor. That inflation factor uh, cross-references Section 43B of the code, uh, which is the inflation factor that is used uh, in the EOR credit, so you may be familiar with it from that context. And basically, it allows the credits to increase each year after 2026, whether it's a credit for secure geological storage or the credit for EOR or utilization to increase beyond these 2026 maximums by this inflation factor. And this inflation factor is uh, computed each year and it is published in the spring for the prior taxable year. So because that information is not available now and is published annually, it does uh, create some variability in models for the value of these credits going forward. But people are more focused now on that inflation factor, which will kick in af after 2026, which now seems to be about right around the corner. So what are some of the requirements for qualifying for the, these Section 45Q credits? And what are some of the other current issues that are coming up? Well, first, the carbon oxide must be ca captured at a qualified facility. That basically breaks down into two different categories. One is an industrial source where the CO2 otherwise would have been emitted into the atmosphere, or it can be captured from ambient air utilizing a direct air capture facility. In either case, the facility must start construction before January 1, 2026, and it must meet certain minimum capture requirements. So interestingly, uh, the guidance with respect to both of those uh, uh, requirements can be found in Notice 2020-12. That, this is a notice that was published specifically about these requirements for the Section 45Q credits, but it borrows heavily from similar tests in the, in the placed in service rules for the wind and solar credits. So if you look at notice 20, 2012 for purposes of what is start of construction requirements, so what must be done before January 1 of 2026, these rules again borrow from the wind and solar rules and they establish that start of construction can be met either by starting physical work of a significant nature, 
and it defines what that means, or relying on the 5% safe harbor. So in other words, incurring 5% of the total costs of the project. And in either case, you must show continuous efforts after start of construction to reach completion and provides a safe harbor uh, for that continuous efforts if you complete the work um, within the taxable year in no longer than six years after the start of construction had begun. So these, uh, this notice also provides uh, another important definition or factors for determining what is the scope of a project. So obviously, if you're trying to meet these requirements for start of construction, uh, significant work, or this 5% minimum cost threshold, you're really going to, in order to apply those, you're going to have to know what is the scope of your project. And the notice provides a number of factors and what you look at for determining the scope of your project. So some of those factors to determine the scope may be whether all of the, whether all of the assets are owned by a single taxpayer, whether all of the, the projects, the, the assets of the project are within the same geological area, whether all of the assets and, and emissions are subject to a single offtake contract so that all the CO2 is collected and goes to the same offtaker, whether the project is subject to a single environmental permitting regime, um, or, whether the, or whether the assets are subject to a single development contract or perhaps a single financing arrangement. All of those factors are, de are considered in determining what is the scope of your project for purposes of applying these start of construction rules. The other re requirement that I mentioned is the minimum capture requirements. And in the minimum capture requirements, it basically looks to whether the emitter is meeting minimum uh, captures, which, are, which is dependent upon um, how the CO2 is either stored or utilized or the nature of the emitter, whether or a power plant or a different type of facility. But very often what has come up with clients is particularly if they are in the storage business and they are going out to the surrounding emitters and trying to sign up customers for the secure geological storage project and helping those emitters qualify for the credits is when they come across these small emitters and helping them qualify for the credits and perhaps applying what the final regulations provided in what's called the aggregation rules to aggregate various small emitters in order to allow them to reach these emissions uh, thresholds and qualify for the credits. So these minimum uh, credit requirements and the aggregation rules relate back to the aggregation rules that I just cited for purposes of the start of construction rules that are found in Notice 2020-12. So often we have those who are developing storage facilities come to us and ask how some of these smaller local emitters can qualify for credits if they don't automatically uh, themselves reach the minimum capture requirements. And often it, it's hard if there are small emitters, uh, but they are independent um, emitters. They are not related. Uh, they, are not ha they don't have a common uh, parent company. One way to try to help these small emitters qualify for the Section 45Q credits which may encourage them to develop carbon capture equipment and then utilize a third party store for secure geological uh, storage services is to perhaps have the uh, provider of secure geological storage services um, finance or own the carbon capture equipment. Because if they are the owner of the carbon capture equipment and they sign up all of the emitters through that carbon capture equipment 
for a single secure geological storage contract that may allow all of those emissions to be aggregated and meet the emissions thresholds and thereby qualify for the credit. So that is something that we have pursued on behalf of storage providers um, to help them sign up smaller emitters in their areas um, by enabling them to claim the Section 45Q credits, um, encouraging them to add the carbon capture equipment. Another thing that we have looked at, another one of the requirements under Section 45Q is that the carbon oxide capture, disposal, utilization, or use must all occur within the United States. And what is the definition of the United States for that purpose? Well, Section 45Q tells us to look at Section 638 of the Code. So Section 638 of the Code not only looks to the contiguous United States, but also the continental shelf. And it includes within the definition of the United States the area over which the United States has exclusive rights under international law with respect to the exploration um, and exploitation of natural resources. So that also includes the offshore areas as well and we've been working with clients looking at offshore storage of CO2, and we really see that as kind of the next frontier for secure geological storage, particularly because it can, it, those could be very, very large areas of secure geological storage offshore without some of the limitations that arise for secure geological storage onshore where there are smaller storage areas. These could be very vast storage areas that would allow um, storage providers to collect and secure, secure CO2 captured from numerous emitters over a long period of time. So another thing that has been a focus of our clients that are in, this, in these CCUS projects is understanding who is eligible for the CCUS credits and to whom might they be transferred. So the CO2 credits primarily belong to taxpayers that capture the CO2 and then themselves um, physically store, dispose, or inject the CO2 or contract for the provision of those services with respect to the CO2 that they capture. So they may end up, they may enter binding written contracts for the provision of those services if they don't do it themselves. We often see emitters consider um, constructing their own secure geological storage for the CO2 that they capture so they can be in complete control of the project. Sometimes that works for the emitter. Sometimes um, there are barriers for them when they see some of the requirements that Jeff Homestead will talk about next about the permitting process, and then they decide to rely on a third-party provider of secure geological storage services. The credits, while primarily belonging to the owner of the carbon capture equipment, can be transferred to a, a third-party provider of storage injection or utilization services so long as that party is in contra direct contractual privity with the emitter that owns the carbon capture equipment. So the way we see that playing out is when an emitter with carbon capture equipment is contracting with a third party to provide these services, as I said at this stage, most likely services to provide secure geological storage there is very often a negotiation that goes on whereby the emitter may choose to retain the credits itself and then pay a fee for the secure geological storage, or it may negotiate to transfer some or all of those credits to the provider of the secure geological storage services in exchange for a reduced sequestration fee. Um, or transportation fee over time in exchange for those credits. That's kind of the negotiation we see happening now. Um, but what's very important, and um, we'll uh, turn to this in a minute, is the value of those credits. 
Section 45Q still may be amended, and it may be amended this year as part of the infrastructure legislation. So it's important to realize that um, Section 45Q is still evolving. So it's very difficult to determine exactly what the credits will be worth, particularly if some of these current proposals are enacted to expand the credit or enhance the credit. So if you are working with a third party provider of secure geological storage services and you do want to claim the Section 45Q credit, it is very important as you negotiate with them that you make sure you have what qualifies as a binding written contract for those services as defined under the Treasury regulations and also that you contain that you include in those contracts with the geological storage provider all of the necessary federal tax reporting with respect to the storage that they're providing also that they're doing the proper monitoring and will report to you any leakage that occurs which is critical for the recapture provisions under section 45q and also that they ensure and report to you that they are meeting all of the epa permitting requirements as well as the epa monitoring requirements that jeff homestead will talk about next all of those are necessary for the emitter to either claim the 45Q uh, credits itself or be able to elect to transfer some of all or all of those credits to someone who is providing the storage injection or utilization services. So finally, what I want to touch on today is some of the current legislative proposals around Section 45Q it's too early to say really which of these changes are likely or less likely to occur, um, but we'll mainly talk about what some of these leading proposals are so you can have them in mind when you are evaluating the economics for a CCUS project or the value of these credits if you're going to try to transfer them um, to a, a provider of storage, utilization, or injection services, po possibly in lieu of a fee that they are going to going to charge for those services. The first thing that we're hearing about is that there there is a consideration to the extend the start of construction deadline. As I mentioned, the current start of construction deadline for the CCUS projects is January 1, 2026. I think it is fairly likely that that date is going to be pushed out. Um, and that is because there is fairly strong bipartisan support for CCUS projects. There is support from Secretary Granholm of the Department of Energy. There is support within the Treasury and the uh, EPA for these projects. So we do, do think that they will push out the deadline for start of construction to give everybody an opportunity who wants to engage in these projects to, to get a start of construction before the, uh, the deadline is set. Um, the second thing we're seeing is enhanced proposals for enhanced credits for certain industries that are hard to decarbonize. So those are, those are industries like cement or uh, steel processing, which it is very hard for them to convert to renewable energy, and they are dependent on fossil fuels and therefore still have a lot of CO2 emissions. We may see an enhanced credit for direct air capture facilities. Um, also, something that is getting a lot of uh, discussion is all, not only having Section 45Q credits that are available to reduce a taxpayer's cash tax liability, but actually making, a, making them available in the form of a cash grant. So it would not be necessary for the taxpayer to have cash tax liability in order to enjoy the benefit of the 45Q credits. That is, they can actually get a cash payment for capturing and storing the CO2. However, the chances are that if it does get converted to a cash grant, that it would be at a lower rate than if the credits were utilized to offset cash tax liabilities. What has also been proposed is a restatement of the minimum capture requirements not to be threshold levels of CO2 that is captured, but a percentage of the emissions. And that to me seems to make more sense. It would allow some of these smaller emitters to more easily uh, qualify for the Section 45Q credits if they are merely 
capturing a majority of their emissions, whatever those emissions may be. And that seems like a, a smarter way to encourage some of these smaller emitters to engage in carbon capture activity. And then lastly, um, we may see a re further reduction or maybe in a, even an elimination of the 45Q credits that uh, have been available for EOR or uh, use as an injectant for oil or gas recovery. There is some pushback over the granting of those credits as seeing those credits as encouraging fossil fuel productions. So there has been some um, pushback on those credits. So those might be more limited going forward. They may reduce the amount of credits that are, that are available if CO2 that is captured is used for enhanced oil or gas recovery. So I think those are the leading proposals right now in terms of amendments for Section 45Q, but our PRG team is watching those very, very closely. But the important thing here is to keep in mind if you are negotiating for the transfer of these credits to a storage provider, an injector, or somebody utilizing your CO2, particularly in exchange for a reduced fee, keep in mind that as of right now, the outlook for 45Q credits isn't static and their value and their longevity and whether they're available as a cash pay may change over time. And with that, I am now going to turn it over to Jeff Homestead, who has some great firsthand experience from working with clients on the rules around per permitting uh, for secure geological storage under the uh, EPA guidance. So with that, I will turn it over to Jeff Homestead. Uh, thanks, and good afternoon to everyone. I'm going to talk just for a few minutes about the environmental permits that uh, that you need to qualify for the 45Q tax credits for carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, the place to start is with the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, which makes it illegal to inject anything into the ground without a permit or a specific rule from EPA. Uh, EPA has established different uh, types of injection well permitting programs. Uh, there are classes one through six, and we're going to be talking primarily about class two permits, which are essentially for any kind of injection related to oil and gas production, and class six permits, which were specifically designed for the geologic sequestration of CO2. Um, to be eligible for, uh, for the 45Q tax credits, uh, the CO2 must be injected into either a class two well or a class six well. Class two is used primarily for EOR, but as I'll talk about in a minute, in some cases, a class two well may also be used for geologic sequestration. Class six wells are really designed for large CO2 sequestration projects. Um, in, in addition to the, the, the permit, the class two or the class six permit, uh, you will also need to uh, to have a specific and separate monitoring and reporting plan uh, uh, under um, under f I'm sorry for class two wells that are used for enhanced oil recovery EOR. Uh, you have the option of having an approved monitoring, reporting, and verification plan, uh, an MRV plan approved by EPA under subpart RR of its regulations, or you can instead comply with an ISO standard. Uh, 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 and so that's the option if you're seeking the 45Q credits for EOR, which are the lower value 45Q credits. For geologic sequestration and, and to obtain the higher value uh, 45Q credits, uh, you, you'll need to have a subpart RR plan approved by by EPA, and, and that's 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 not a trivial exercise. So keep in mind that that's a separate requirement. Um, it, just a, a word about sort of the, the 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 degree of difficulty when it comes to getting a Class Two permit versus a Class Six permit. Um, today there are roughly 180,000 operating Class II wells in the United States. Uh, Texas alone has about 30,000 Class II wells. And today, uh, uh, in the history of the program, uh, there have only been two Class VI permits issued by EPA, both in the state of Illinois, one for the ill-fated uh, FutureGen project, and then another one for ADM's manufacturing facility in Illinois. And so that ADM facility has an approved Class VI well and is the only operating Class VI well in the United States today. Um, 
in the last year, uh, several additional permits have been, uh, permit applications have been submitted. The first was in March, uh, a company called Gulf Coast Se Sequestration submitted a class six application for a large sequestration project near Lake Charles, uh, uh, Louisiana. And it, it's a matter of public record that we, we represent uh, Gulf Coast Sequestration and uh, have some experience in what uh, and, have, and have actually been representing them in their interactions with EPA uh, regarding the, their Class Six application. Since then, three more uh, applications, at least partial applications, have been submitted. Um, uh, and so now there are, uh, it, it, none of them have yet been determined to be complete by EPA, but there's four that are currently in the process. Um, so that's just a, a little bit about sort of distinctions between class six and class two wells. The, the other thing to think about is, is where you will get your permit. Um, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, EPA is able to and, and likes to uh, delegate the primary authority to, for, the, for, for processing and, and enforcing the permits to states. Under the Safe Drinking Water Act, that's called primacy, and so a state uh, is able to obtain primacy on a on a class by class basis. So some states have primacy for several different types of wells, um, and there's other states that I think don't have primacy for any. But just given um, the number of class two wells, uh, almost all of those wells are issued by states. Uh, Forty states, including really all of the oil and gas states, have received primacy from EPA for class two wells. And as of today, there are only two states that have received primacy for class six wells. That's North Dakota and Wyoming. Um, uh, Louisiana and Texas are in the process of submitting their applications for primacy for class six wells. Uh, and in fact, I think Louisiana has submitted its application. Um, EPA says it doesn't, doesn't want to tell you how long it takes to get primacy, but typically it takes about, about a year. Um, and so Louisiana may have primacy in the next year. I, I think the state is a little more optimistic than that, but, but, um, but let's say a year, and Texas is, is not far behind. Oh, it, it, some of you may, 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 may know this, but, but you know, why is that important? Uh, historically, I will just tell you as a as a practical matter, um, uh, it has it has states have been more efficient in processing and issuing permits, and again, historically, for all different types of permits, uh, they they tend to work a little more cooperatively with with applicants. They tend to have relationships, and so historically, getting the same kind of permit with the same requirements just takes less time for. Uh, for uh, to get from a state typically than from, from EPA. Um, however, uh, it's not just a matter of getting a permit. You also need to get a permit that is legally defensible um, because the expectation is uh, some, probably all of these, will ultimately be challenged. And, and so the question is not only whether the state is the permitting authority, but whether uh, it has sort of the, the, the expertise um, to, to, to process and, and to and to create a permitting record that will withstand judicial scrutiny. Um, so, so, uh, so, so keep that in mind. Um, l let me just talk briefly uh, uh, about the different types of, of wells um, in, in just a bit more detail. So uh, class two wells, class two UIC wells, are used for a number of different things uh, in the oil and gas industry. Uh, the, the majority are used for enhanced oil recovery operations, for EOR, that are also used for hydrogen sulfide um, uh, uh, wells, um, and, and for a, a few other things related to, uh, to, to the oil and gas, um, into, the, into, into oil and gas. Uh, 45Q recognizes that EOR wells will result in some volumes of CO2 being, being permanently trapped in the reservoir, um, and so there is the tax credit of $35 a ton available to EOR operations. Um, uh, but there is also a recognition that over time, uh, as the CO2 is injected, the oil and gas field may become less and less productive and may ultimately um, need to be re-permitted as a Class Six well. Uh, the state of Texas had sort of its own approach for that. They looked primarily at the at, at whether the field is producing oil and gas in 
um, in commercially significant quantities. Uh, once, uh, once you re reach the point where that's no longer the case, they will require you to, um, to be re-permitted as a class six well. Um, so, so class two well for, for EOR, typically you'll get that permit from the state and that can be transitioned to a class six well uh, either at the, at the request of the, of the permit holder or it may be required by, by, by the state, by the permitting authority. Um, so that's class two wells for EOR. Uh, EPA's regulations and the 45Q regulations specifically acknowledge that class six wells may also be used for injecting fluids which are brought to the surface in connection with convention, conventional uh, oil and gas production. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we think of acid gas wells, but, but it's also understood under both the Treasury Department regulations and in EPA's practice that class two wells, if the CO2 comes from conventional oil and gas operations, may be used for geologic sequestration. And in that case, uh, the well is el eligible for, for the higher value credit. Um, there's no formal process for converting a non-EOR class two well into a class six well, but this would presumably be allowed or even required under the regulations. I, I will say though that whether any particular well can be classified as a class uh, as a class two well instead of a class six well will be um, very case specific based on the facts of the proposed well and and also on the state regulations because state regulations don't always necessarily track exactly the way the way EPA's regulations work um, you're probably most interested in class six wells and these are the wells again so far the major the, the major project um, have announced that they are seeking class six permits and that is the expectation probably for the majority of the of the geologic sequestration sites in the United States. Um, the, the kinds of issues that are raised, whether you're seeking a class two well or a class six well, are 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 similar, but but the process is much more rigorous and the kind of um, data and analysis that needs to be provided for a class six well is much greater than for a class two well. This is based on um, especially the higher pressures, the higher volumes, the higher risk of migration um, of, of CO2 uh, into drinking water su supplies. So, um, and again, I, if you look at the class two regulations versus the class six regulations, you'll see that they address similar issues, but the requirements are more stringent for class six wells when it comes to siting and the kind of geological study that you need to do, the kind of reservoir modeling that you need to do. Uh, the construction requirements are somewhat different. Um, the monitoring requirements are, are more stringent. Uh, you need to have a number of different plans approved by EPA including a corrective action plan, a post-injection site closure plan, a plugging plan, um, and, uh, and so there are specific pieces that need to be approved by EPA. And, and also, as with all UIC wells, there needs to be a financial responsibility um, uh, instrument that is, that, that, that to ensure that there will be Resources to eventually to, to eventually close to, to eventually close the well. Um, just a few lessons I think that we've already learned from the um, from the fr from going through the permitting process. It, I, what, what I would say this at this point is uh, getting a class six permit is is no mean feat, um, uh, and and I think. Partly, uh, the people who are in that process now, there's there's just the growing pains of, of developing any new program. And so, what EPA has told us, what states have told us, is they acknowledge that it will probably take longer uh, to get the first few permits. Then, but they eventually hope uh, to be able to process, process the permits in a, a year to 18 months, is is what is what they say. Um, at this point, based on our, our experience, that seems to be overly optimistic. Um, I will also say that, um, that so far, I think there was an expectation, and as a matter of public policy, 
you would not expect the requirements for a CO2 injection well to be as demanding as the requirements for a hazardous waste injection well. But, but EPA very much seems to be using the class one hazardous waste injection well as, as, sort, of a, as sort of a model. Um, a couple of other things that, that I would say is um, EPA has a specific data tool uh, an electronic submission process that you are required to use for a Class Six permit application called the Geologic Sequestration Data Tool, the GSDT. Um, you shouldn't rely simply on the way that is set up because EPA expects a lot more detail and you need to look sort of at what they said in their guidance documents um, and, and even spend some time looking. There's a, there's a crosswalk document that's available on EPA's website. So getting a, a Class Six permit is, uh, is not an easy task, but, but EPA has said, and, and, and I believe that this is a high priority, they certainly want to promote um, uh, CCS. CCS is really one of the few climate-related issues where there is broad bipartisan support. And so I think the Trump administration, um, or the Biden administration, was just as eager as the Trump administration to, to make these, 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 pro these, these permits possible. Um, the, the final thing I wanted to, to mention, and, and I think my time is almost up here, is that in addition to getting the, the UIC permits, whether it's a class six or a class two, um, you will also need other approvals and permits. I mentioned the monitoring and reporting plan, that's, that's a separate thing, but you'll also need uh, state permits in, in, and, and the permitting requirements vary to some extent from state to state. They generally require notice to nearby landowners um, uh, and there needs to be Anyway, I, I think I, I think some of my colleagues are going to talk a little bit more about some of the some of the lands rights issues that 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 arise. But you'll need to get state permits. You may need to get either a minor source or a major source air permit. You may need to get a water act permit. So there there are um, there are a number of permits that you that you may well need from either EPA or the state government. But in terms of of um, uh, in terms of the sequencing, the thing that will take the longest is likely the Class Six permit, or, or even if it's a Class Two permit, getting the approved MRV plan from EPA. So, with that, I will uh, I will thank you for your time, and I will turn the time over to my colleagues JJ McAnally and Austin Lee. Thank you. Welcome back to Bracewell's Future of Carbon Capture, Utilization, and Sequestration webinar with a brief discussion on land rights in the carbon management space. I'm JJ McAnally, co-head of Oil and Gas Group at Bracewell. I've also got today with me my colleague, our partner in our Oil and Gas Group, Austin Lee. Both Austin and I each have various carbon capture, utilization, sequestration projects in process in our shop, as, as well as the myriad of one-off questions that come in daily about projects being considered out in industry. Those projects and questions will color the content of our discussions today. I thought we'd start off real quick with a high-level uh, map that Austin and I used in our recent Law Review article, The Way Forward, which you can find on Bracewell's website. This map shows with broad brushstrokes some of the areas with good potential for carbon storage underground. As you'll notice, it includes not only saline formations, but also oil and gas reservoirs. It's interesting to look at this map in conjunction with the next map, which was put together by the Great Plains Institute, which shows the emitters presenting near-term 45Q eligibility for tax credits. The overlap between the two maps is patently evident. Many of the near, -term, near and medium-term facility locations, a little hard to read on the map, it's indicated in purple, overlying in proximity to the saline formations and oil and gas reservoirs with good potential for carbon dioxide storage. One area with a high correlation between the two maps is Texas. Given in Austin's and Maya's familiarity with Texas law, we will focus efforts there in today's session. You know, daily reports abound of new CCUS projects and good intentions to lower carbon footprints. A bit of a land rush appears to be getting underway, kind of similar to the shale land rush 10 and 15, 20 years ago, with the intention to tie up some of the locations on the maps for not only both emission sources and for ultimately for carbon storage. Today's presentation will focus on the land aspects of the CCUS project lifecycle. So let's get into the details a bit further. 
let's discuss where land comes into the picture. You know, for both EUR and sequestration, captured CO2 obviously is going to have to be injected subsurface into geological formations and hopefully stay there for purposes of 45Q tax credits, which Liz has discussed in her segment. This involves both depleted reservoirs and deep saline formations, which were indicated on the map we just looked at. So what real property rights are necessary for CO2 injection and storage? You know, first, access to the surface estate. This, you know, will involve a well site, uh, surface facilities, uh, surface access to the well site uh, to conduct operations. And then after that, you'll need rights into this to the subsurface geological pore space. On this second point, I'm going to turn it over to Austin Lee, let him unpack the surface aspects, surface rights aspects uh, of the CCUS project. Thank you, JJ. It may seem counterintuitive, but the surface estate does actually own the geological pore space beneath the tract in question. There's Texas case law that bears this out, and, and so it's important to understand exactly you know, what rights you need to get in order to get access to that geological pore space. These rights are granted and, and governed by, in a lot of cases, the chain of title to the surface estate, and that will, each tract will be impacted by a facts and circumstances set of documents that co constitute the chain of title to that tract. So that'll govern who owns the surface and the accompanying pore space, what limits are there, on the rights to use that pore space and that surface estate. And, and in a lot of cases, you know, who else will have the ability or certain rights as it relates to those, to those estates. So kind of stepping back, generally, you know, a, someone would own the property in fee simple, uh, determinable, which is, you know, the mineral estate, the surface estate, you know, even the groundwater estate. But each of those different estates can be severed from the other. And once you sever them, that kind of splits them off into a, a completely different real property interest that can have and be impacted in its own different chain of title. A separate estate will not be governed or recognized until the time of severance. And, you know, basically once that happens, you know, that can get conveyed out separately from the other different um, severed estates. So as you'll see on the next slide, the mineral estate is important in the context of CCUS or sequestration or EOR, as the mineral estate is dominant over the surface. Um, you know, you can see the mineral estate has these various rights to it, the right to develop, the right to lease, the right to receive various payments for the minerals that are produced. Um, but essentially, it's the right to go in and produce the minerals from the tract in question. Um, as part of that, and the principal characteristic that makes it the dominant estate, is that the surface has this implied right to use as much of the, the mineral estate has the implied right to use as much of the surface estate as is necessary to develop the minerals from the tract in question. You know, there are some limits on this. One example uh, is the accommodation doctrine. You can't, if you're the mineral owner, you can't go and, and disrupt an existing surface use uh, to the extent there's an alternative available on that tract uh, that allows you to develop the minerals. You can't go put a drilling rig in the middle of somebody's house. Um, but, you know, this, this dominance of the mineral estate is very important, and it, you know, it will impact the ability to use the surface rights for sequestration or uh, EOR purposes. Importantly, as we'll see a little bit more detail on the next slide, the mineral estate does not extend to the subsurface geological structures. Again, that's part of the surface estate. So, you know, an example of this that we come and get inquiries about is salt domes. You know, salt is a mineral, um, you know, and so there's been questions uh, based on some interpretations of, of law in, in Texas especially as to whether or not you know, a salt dome, because it is composed of minerals, is part of the mineral estate and not part of the surface estate. Um, it's not. The surface estate covers the geological pore space that, that is included in a salt dome, but it's an important distinction that you can't go in there and interfere, especially in that context, with the ability to take the minerals out of, you know, the mineral estate and, and the tract in question. 
you know, the mineral state can have a trespass claim against surface owners and other third parties. Um, <clears throat> but that's only if this unauthorized access, whether that be through an injected material or something else, infringes upon the mineral owners or that lessee's ability to exercise its rights to develop the mineral estate. You know, in certain situations, mineral estate holders where they have, you know, a trespass claim or, or a similar claim can, can receive compensation for delayed, you know, enjoyment of their royalties, the delayed ability to develop. Um, and they can also get injunctive relief in certain situations where the in, the interference with the mineral estate is, is set to cause irreparable harm. So I'll pass it over to JJ and he can and talk a little bit more about the sequestration process and some of the land rights to consider as you're going through that piece. So let's talk land rights with respect to sequestration projects. And, you know, the focus here is the permanent storage of captured CO2. Um, and this will be, you know, you'll see as we get into enhanced oil recovery later with the operations and the injection operations of CO2 and sequestration is ancillary to oil and gas operations. So how do you acquire the rights to possess the subsurface geological pore space that Austin was, was discussing? Well, obviously, there's a lot of, of real property uh, rights analysis. There's a title analysis that needs to be undertaken of the subject lands. Uh, to get into all of these different aspects that, that Austin was touching upon. Is there a split estate? Uh, is, you know, are the minerals severed from the surface? Is there an oil and gas lessee? Um, you know, are there operations ongoing by that oil and gas lessee? Uh, are there uh, operations potentially in the future, uh, not only in the current productive formations, but in, in other formations uh, uh, above or below uh, the current ongoing operations, you know, are there depleted formations, you know, all of these different pieces uh, of the oil and gas aspect, as well as the surface have to be analyzed first. And then once you have that analysis completed, you're ready to go out and acquire your rights. Uh, obviously, the first first thing you're going to have to do is go out and acquire rights from the surface owner to the, to the pore space, as we discussed, as Austin was discussing. Uh, you know, this could be in the form of a surface use agreement, uh, could be in the form of an easement, uh, or it could be a purchase uh, of the surface estate outright in fee. And then obviously to the extent there is um, ongoing oil and gas operations, you know, and while you do have uh, the poor space rights tied up from the surface owner, you then have to watch out for these oil and gas operations and take those into consideration in the rights that you obtain uh, prior to your injection operations. Uh, you know, it's important just to keep in mind that, you know, if your oil and if your if your CO2 injection uh, operations prevent, diminish, impede, somehow delay the recovery uh, of the minerals, you know, you may have to pay damages or you may find yourself enjoined uh, from your storage operations. You know, also, it's just it's interesting to note that in the permitting process, um, you know, both at the state and the federal level uh, for your injection well permits uh, will involve uh, notice to all applicable uh, mineral estate owners. Uh, Jeff Homestead will touch on this a little bit in regulatory aspects of uh, CCUS projects. So next, uh, let Austin discuss uh, enhanced oil recovery projects in the CCUS space. Thanks, JJ. So, you know, enhanced oil recovery is effectively just producing oil from old depleted rev reservoirs where the, the natural pressure of those reservoirs has dissipated and the parties need to inject CO2 or sometimes other gases in order to repressurize that formation and help lift that oil to the top. Um, you know, it is, it is production of oil and gas, just like most oil and gas lessees in the conventional way, um, and, and requires the same, you know, land component that all oil and gas operations have, which we've been discussing, which is, you know, conducting title review, you know, leasing the mineral estate in, in all of the tracks that are impacted by the development and understanding how those, you know, how your leases work and, and what the terms of them are and all of those things. So there is a, a substantial land component to just EOR in and of itself. 
And as we mentioned, you know, the mineral estate is dominant, does have that implied right to use the surface, but in certain situations, uh, in order to appropriately inject the, uh, the CO2, as you're seeing in this, in this picture here on the slide, you know, other subsurface pore space rights uh, in, in portions of the surface estate may be necessary uh, to be obtained by the EOR operator, <clears throat> you know, just to make sure you have the full suite of rights needed to conduct all the operations that you, that you need to conduct for EOR. You know, importantly, in the context of today's modern CCUS projects, you know, you're going to have, you know, traditionally, you know, naturally occurring CO2 has been used in a lot of cir circumstances for EOR. But today, anthropogenic CO2 coming from emitters and captured off, you know, industrial facilities and the like is, is going to become used as part of this, you know, kind of new wave of CCUS projects. And so, you know, the emitters and the other parties are, are going to be entering into joint ventures and, and different arrangements uh, with the EOR operators as part of a CCUS project here. Uh, so it's important not only for the EOR operator to have all the rights and to understand, you know, how its leases and how its various contracts work, but it's important for the other parties to those structures and those JVs to understand it as well. Um, that's part of the documenting phase of those joint ventures and the various contractual arrangements that the parties are going to enter into. And it impacts directly the economics because the EOR typically will add another revenue source, you know, the sale of the oil and gas that's produced uh, to the project economics. And so, you know, understanding that just like any other portion of the economics of the project will be, you know, a big part of that. And it all hinges back on the land rights that we're discussing today. So, you know, EOR is an oil and gas operation, and we'll go to the next slide. And, and you can see some of the unique issues that, they, that they're dealing with. Um, and, and things that, you know, people who are entering into joint ventures with these EOR operators need to understand are, you know, you're going to pay royalties to the, to the mineral owner less, lessors under the oil and gas leases. And, and those royalties are going to be paid on the extractive, n extracted native mineral substances, so the oil that's under there. Uh, and, they sh and, they, and they'll be governed by the express terms of the leases, which we'll talk about, you know, what what costs get subtracted out in calculating those royalties and all these other things that are commonplace in the oil and gas industry, but it directly impacts the economics of the project. Importantly, royalties, you know, should not be owed on the injected substances, or if they are, you should be able to, you know, understand that <laughs> as part of the economics of your project. But, <clears throat> you know, just another thing that you have to kind of understand as a participant in one of these projects and as an EOR operator that you need to make sure your leases say what, what you think they do as far as, you know, what royalties will be owed. Another aspect of EOR is that these projects typically, you know, utilize an entire reservoir over a very large area. And so unitization of the entire area and all the different mineral interest and in, in tracks in question is, is, is often a component of this. And unitization is, fe is effectively a pooling of all of those leases and all the uh, the interest in the in the tracks covered, so that you can conduct operations, you know, for an entire unit. Uh, that will help maintain and preserve the term of the leases as you produce them. Uh, it'll it'll allow you to you know conduct operations in a more efficient manner. Uh, it will require people if there's other third party working interest owners, you know, that own leases in the area to share in their fair share of the cost. And, and it, you know, it involves a unit agreement and a unit operating agreement and some other contractual structures that people need to understand. Importantly, uh, if, if a unit has been approved in Texas by the Railroad Commission for, for some of this, it will give a different uh, construct of what trespass claims against the operators can be made. So it'll put it out of a kind of a common law trespass claim and more into kind of a nuisance type claim, which requires, you know, the proving of damages as opposed to just proving that, you know, something that was injected uh, went somewhere it wasn't, uh, where you didn't have the right to be. So that's an important kind of quirk of having a unit agreement for EOR purposes, uh, you know, that people should be aware of. So finishing up in one area that we get a lot of questions on is uh, federal waters. There's obviously a lot of, lot of interest in, uh, in possible sequestration, possible EOR operations uh, offshore. Um, and unfortunately, I, I think the, the bottom line is there the federal, the federal government construct 
uh, regulatory construct and legal construct currently um, is going to need to be changed uh, and fast. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's it's antiquated. Um, you know, first, it's unclear if the Department of Interior uh, you know, has statutory authority uh, relative to CCUS. Uh, and then when you get down into some of the laws, uh, OXLA, as it's called, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act that, that governs operations and governs uh, legal rights uh, on the Outer Continental Shelf and the implementing uh, regulations underneath that you know, do not address CCUS. Um, you know, there's just some narrow exceptions uh, uh, for, for sequestration related to coal-fired power plants. Uh, and there's many other regulations that, that may cause issues as well. Uh, we've mentioned the Ocean Dumping Act here that may uh, some, some practitioners think might, might uh, uh, cause the, the need for a, a, per, a permit or a uh, uh, other regulatory approval. Uh, I think all of this is probably a topic for another segment uh, by some of our regulatory lawyers, including Ann Navarro uh, in our D.C. office. She's ex-Department of Interior. Um, and, and, you know, really to get into the nuances of what needs to be done, as well as, uh, you know, onshore federal lands, uh, it's, it's probably a topic for another day. So wrapping up, uh, you know, a quick take here on, uh, you know, real property side of CCUS. Uh, 20 minutes is always tough to cover a topic that, that touches on real estate title, uh, but hopefully we gave a little insight to guide the CCUS land rush. Thanks, JJ and Austin. Our next section is regarding the types of commercial agreements that you'll see in a CCUS project. I'm Patrick Johnson. I am an associate in our Houston office. I work in our projects group. My practice spans the energy value chain. I work on energy and infrastructure projects, M&A transactions, joint ventures, other commercial agreements. Um, I started my career at baseball. I also did a stint in-house at ExxonMobil, working on various offshore oil and gas projects and also some LNG projects. And CCUS, I'll tell you, is becoming an increasing focus for us over the last year. And so excited to talk further with this group about what we're seeing. So as we get going, I think it's important to remember that carbon capture and utilization is not a new concept. Bracewell's been involved in a number of carbon capture and utilization projects going back decades. Many of these projects are uh, intended to capture CO2 and use it for the reinjection into oil reservoirs, otherwise known as enhanced oil recovery. We've worked on projects including the Energy Petronova project, and obviously more recently we've done a number of, or are working on a number of uh, carbon capture and sequestration projects. So when we're thinking about the types of agreements that we'll see in a CCUS project, it's important to think about the types of services that need to be provided in a CCUS project. First, you've got to capture the CO2. Typically, the types of emitters that you're going to see are going to be uh, energy generation facilities, and so you're going to need a capture facility on site to capture the CO2 that's emitted. Then you have to transport the CO2 through a pipeline, and ultimately you've got to sequester it underground in a very large cavern, or you've got to utilize it probably in enhanced oil recovery, or EOR. So the types of participants that you're going to see in these projects include an emitter, and we're going to talk about two different types of emitters, but in either case, a emitter is likely to be a biofuel or facility or refinery, a thermal power plant or a gas processing facility. In any case, this facility generates significant CO2, and the emitter has decided that uh, this first type of emitter has decided that it wants to capture the CO2 and utilize or monetize the tax credits and other economic incentives that exist uh, with respect to the capture of CO2. The second type of emitter is an emitter that wants to pay a fee to someone who will capture the CO2, a service provider that will capture the CO2, and that service provider is going to be the one to use or monetize the credits. So that's the emitter. And then the other 
primary participant in, in this structure is the midstream company. A midstream company is going to be responsible for transporting the CO2 to the sequestration or utilization facility. And then ultimately, you're going to have either that same midstream company that's providing transportation or it's, it's conceivable that you have a separate uh, midstream company that is providing sequestration or in the case of a utilization uh, scenario, you have an upstream company that is going to be doing the, the EOR. We have seen both types of emitters. So let's talk about the 45Q tax credits. The 45Q tax credits are available to the person who acts as the capture party. And, and this is attractive to many emitters. And because of this, many emitters that we've seen have decided to act as the capture party so that they can take advantage of these credits. And with this structure, the emitter has the responsibility for establishing the capture equipment, but it's also possible that the midstream company that's providing the transportation or the sequestration will, in fact, uh, construct the capture facility or con construct the capture equipment for the emitter. And it's also possible that the midstream company could uh, enter into an arrangement where there's, there's a financing of the equipment that gets paid by the emitter uh, over the life of the project. Um, in any case, the midstream company is going to take the CO2 at the fence line of the emitter's facility. That's the delivery point for the, uh, the CO2 pipeline. And it's going to transport the CO2 uh, to, to the inlet flange of the sequestration or use facility. So before we talk about the actual legal agreements that govern these arrangements, Let's talk a little bit about the key commercial points that come up as parties discuss how to, to structure these commercial agreements. So first, it's important to remember that when, you're, when you have these types of CO2 pipelines, it's as with an oil pipeline or any other type of uh, pipeline that we see in the energy industry, it's possible that you're going to have multiple receipt points. In fact, a lot of the midstream service providers are focused on building pipelines that can service um, multiple receipt points and that face multiple shippers. And then there's also the possibility that you'll have multiple destinations. So take the example of sequestration. It's possible that the midstream company, for the sake of flexibility, is going to try and have multiple sequestration sites that it can uh, store or sequester the CO2 it's, it's transporting. Uh, it's also important to remember, we talked about this in our previous slide, that the emitter retains the ownership of CO2. So typically you'll have the type of uh, title and custody arrangement. Title stays with the emitter. Care and custody goes with the, the uh, midstream company providing transportation uh, that you would see in, in other types of uh, transportation agreements that, that may be more familiar. There's also, this is an interesting point from an environmental perspective, the exposure that uh, we typically see when it comes to CO2 emissions is centered around these tax credits that, that are gained by the 45Q tax credit. So you have to demonstrate for 45Q purposes that you're you're sequestering the CO2 that you purport to sequester. So that, that's the biggest exposure for a loss of product along the pipeline or uh, when it comes to the inlet flange of the sequestration facility. And then an interesting, other interesting point to, to just consider here, the CO2 pipelines are not currently regulated by FERC. So obviously FERC's jurisdiction is established by statute Congress would have to enact or modify the enact a new statute or modify the existing statute to expand the jurisdiction of FERC. Uh, that obviously has not happened yet, but there are a number of midstream participants that are structured have decided that it that they should go ahead and plan for the possibility of FERC jurisdiction and 
are structuring their uh, commercial arrangements in the way that we would in um, a, a FERC jurisdictional pipeline with things like a, a tariff. So we mentioned this earlier. The sequestration party is, is typically the same midstream company that provides transportation. Now, there may be reasons when, when you're setting up your transportation agreement and your sequestration agreement to provide for optionality and to, to contemplate for financing purposes or for other equity transactions the possibility that you've got either two different midstream companies that are providing the transportation services and the sequestration services respectively, or that at some later date and time that you'll have two separate entities providing those respective services. And then we're going to circle back quickly to utilization. So the utilization party is typically an upstream company, an oil company, uh, that is, is using the CO2 for uh, its enhanced oil recovery projects. So the, the arrangements look a little bit different in the context of utilization. The EOR project could be between the joint venture and the emitter or the upstream uh, party. And then it's also possible that the commercial agreements will, will be modified to contemplate some type of industrial use like cement manufacturing. All right. So we move from the key commercial points into the types of agreements that we typically see in these, these projects. So the first one is the transportation services agreement. And as, as I've mentioned on some of the other slides, this arrangement is kind of similar to what you would see in oil and gas transportation service agreements. So you have an MVC, the shipper commits to a minimum monthly volume, the carrier provides firm service up to a specified amount. The volumes are the, the uh, receipt point for the volumes is the inlet flange of the pipeline. And then the delivery point or the destination point is, in the case of sequestration, the, the, uh, the inlet flange of the sequestration facility or in the utilization or the EOR project, it's, it's the inlet flange of the utilization facility. There are some other terms that you might typically see in a career transportation pipeline. Um, as with any other pipeline where you've got to get, acquire a number of right-of-ways, you've got to get a number of permits, and it's also a very large capital investment, um, you typically will see uh, some conditions precedent to the party's obligations in the TSA based on a final investment decision typically by the carrier, but it, I guess it's also possible that you could see an FID uh, CP by both the shipper and the carrier. And then also there are a number of permits that that uh, need to be obtained and so there's a CP related typically to those obtaining those permits. So the transportation rates are measured in thousand cubic feet. If you think about the uh, typical time lag between entering into your TSA and commencing service after the pipeline is constructed, it's appropriate and wise to have inflationary indexes to adjust those tariff rates over time. Uh, and then there's also adjustments typically for increased tax credits and for other changes in law. And then finally, those midstream participants that we talked about earlier that see a potential for FERC jurisdiction typically will structure the TSA to relate to a tariff so that theoretically you could deal with walk-up shippers on your pipeline if at some later date a CO2 pipeline becomes FERC jurisdictional. And then finally, and this is something we'll talk about on a later slide, but uh, typically in a TSA we would expect to see some limitation of liability for losses related to tax credits. So if you're in a world where the emitter has decided that it wants to keep the tax credits and act as the capture party, you'll see a limitation of liability that the shipper's losses related to 45Q tax credits and other environmental liabilities uh, will not be, uh, will, will be 
limit the recovery for those will be will be limited by means of the TSA. So the sequestration services agreement will have a lot of the same concepts that we see in the TSA. Uh, just as with the TSA, you'll have a, a an MVC, a minimum monthly volume commitment by the shipper. The the one important thing about uh, measurement of the volumes is so the, the measurement of the volumes that are coming in to the sequestration site are important for demonstrating uh, compliance with the 45Q tax credit regime and also for uh, emitters that are trying to sell their refined products into the California market that want to meet the low carbon fuel standards it will be really important to demonstrate the volumes with specificity, the volumes that are being sequestered at the sequestration site. So the way that the best way probably to handle that is to have all of the volumes measured at the inlet flange, have all the volumes measured by the midstream service provider that is providing transportation services at the delivery point or the destination point to the sequestration site. And then these last two bullets deal with trying to demonstrate compliance for 45Q purposes and for any other um, credits that are being sought under the California regime or otherwise. So you'll typically see in the SSA some type of covenant from the, sequest the sequesterer or the facility operator that the operator will operate the facility as a secure geologic storage facility and that tracks uh, the language and the relevant federal statutes um, and, and that it will not use the CO2 for enhanced oil or natural gas recovery projects. So it's a sequestration project is, is distinct from a uh, EOR or utilization project and in order to, to recover the tax credits, that has to continue to be the case. And then the other element here is that in the, C the sequestration services agreement, there is a prescriptive or detailed set of reporting requirements um, that the operator and the uh, customer will work through to, to uh, demonstrate a record of compliance with respect to the 45Q credits. Okay, and then another agreement that you might see more in the context of a utilization project is a CO2 supply agreement. So the seller in a CO2 supply agreement is going to be the emitter or the uh, party that has the rights to the CO2. And then the buyer is the party that's going to be using the CO2 in its enhanced oil recovery operations. And so the, the terms are slightly different than the, a TSA or an SSA. The seller commits to supply up to a maximum daily quantity of CO2 that the buyer is going to use in its operations. And then as with other um, kind of crude or other refined product agreements that you may have seen, the buyer makes periodic nominations for volumes necessary for its operations. And there's a, there's a ceiling on that. There's a cap based on the contractually agreed maximum daily quantity. The uh, rates charged are in 1,000 cubic feet with the buyer, and the buyer has the obligation to take all of the volumes that are delivered to the buyer by seller and that meet the quality specifications set out in the agreement. And if for some reason the seller is, is failing to meet those quality specifications, typically the buyer will have a prescribed set of remedies. It may be that the buyer can seek reimbursement from the seller for the off-spec product or, and this could be a series of cascading or uh, tiered consequences or remedies, there, there may ultimately be a termination right for continued failure to meet the quality specifications by the seller. And then finally, in some cases, particularly when you see really low oil or commodity prices, it's possible that the buyer or seller has some type of economic out or to, to terminate the agreement um, if the economics no longer makes sense. Or rather than a termination right, this may also be a suspension right. So the last series of slides for us deal with some of the other 
key topics that come up when, when we're negotiating these agreements. And a lot of these topics focus on just the, the contractual risk allocation between, between the parties to those agreements. So the first one on our list to consider is force majeure. So force majeure is dealt with in a number of different ways in these agreements. You'll typically see a force majeure event for the midstream company providing the transportation or sequestration services. And then depending on how negotiations unfold, you, you could see some type of shipper force majeure as well. Um, but then one of the kind of key topics that always comes up is what about the facilities upstream of the, tr the pipeline or downstream of the pipeline or the sequestration facility? And so there, there are different means by which you can address those scenarios and, and the parties can decide how, whether or not those should constitute force majeure. And then the other topic that always comes up is planned outages. So both the sequestration facility or the utilization facility and the pipeline are going to have periodic outages for maintenance. And uh, the parties over the course of negotiations will, will have to decide on how they want to treat those planned outages. MVC, so this is more relevant. The minimum volume commitment is a, is a big topic in the TSA and the sequestration services agreement. Obviously, there's a different construct when it comes to supply agreements that we typically see in EOR projects. Um, but you see this both ways. Sometimes there's, there's a, a, a more a more carrier or operator in the case of sequestration uh, friendly approach would be that the shipper or the customer does not have a credit bank for its failure to, to meet the MVC threshold. In other cases, you'll see uh, mechanics where if the shipper fails to meet its minimum volume commitment, it pays an amount equal to the transportation rate uh, multiplied by the, the deficiency volume, and then that amount is effectively held in escrow, and, and if in a subsequent time period, month, quarter, whatever the prescribed time period is, there is uh, the, the product that's transported or sequestered is, is in excess of the MVC, then the, the amounts that are deposited or escrowed in this credit bank are applied as the transportation or sequestration rates for that excess volume. And then another a big topic that comes up in terms of risk allocation is construction risk. So the midstream company obviously doesn't want to, to spend the dollars to build the infrastructure necessary to build the pipeline, to build a sequestration site, uh, unless it has certainty with respect to the revenues that it's going to be receiving over the life of its agreements with its shippers and customers. So one, one topic that frequently comes up in negotiations and is structured around is what happens? Does, does the customer or the shipper have a termination right? And if so, if they have a termination right and the shipper or the customer terminates before the pipeline or the sequestration site is online, should the midstream company have some type of reimbursement right for the cost that's expended? for CapEx to date. And then the final item on this slide, this is probably something that is more attractive to the midstream company uh, that is, is spending the dollars on the infrastructure for the pipeline and the sequestration site, particularly so if the midstream company is also constructing the capture facilities on behalf of the shipper. Um, should your TSA or your SSA contemplate set-off rights where the midstream company has the right to, uh, to set off amounts that are owed under its other agreements with the, uh, the shipper or the customer against the amounts owed under that specific agreement? And then our last two items to discuss are termination rights and assignability. So, with respect to termination, we, we talked about what happens with respect to sunk costs in the event of a termination. 
Uh, and then on the customer or the shipper side, if if you're in a world where you're an emitter and you've decided that you want to try and maintain the uh, the, the capture responsibility and thus the pursue the 45Q credits and perhaps uh, some type of LCFS certification under the, the CARB standards in California. If you fail, for example, to obtain your LCFS certification and, and thus your project economics are compromised, should you have a right to terminate? That's, that's a topic that frequently comes up as well. And then the last one on termination is, is very straightforward, but it's also an important topic for the parties to sort out, and that is, should there be an outside date? If the midstream company that's constructing the pipeline and the sequestration facilities or the util or in the case of uh, EOR, the upstream company that's responsible for the utilization facilities, if that party fails to construct those facilities by a date that is being relied upon by, by both, both parties, um, should there be a termination, right? And that also ties to the reimbursement right that we discussed on our previous slide. And then the last item here is assignability. So as is common in many of the other commercial agreements that we may be familiar with from other energy transactions, uh, if there's going to be an assignment, really with respect to the midstream company or the, the, ship, the emitter, shipper, customer, uh, we, we would, in most cases, the the non-assigning party is going to expect that the assignee is a creditworthy entity. So you may have some restrictions on assignability around creditworthiness, and then also you, you may have some restrictions around um, the the assignee's uh, ability to to operate the assets or their experience in the sector, uh, and then also you, you may see that there's some parameters around the level of the assignee's investment in, in the, either the emitting facilities or uh, the, the infrastructure that comprises the CCUS project. So those are the big topics that I wanted to, to cover today. These CCUS projects are very interesting. They're, they're very novel um, and they're, they're a fascinating blend of things that have been done for a while and some legal concepts that we've seen for a number of years and also some some very cutting edge arrangements and, and concepts to deal with. So with that, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Brad. Thank you, Patrick. Good afternoon. Today, I'll briefly discuss the evolution of carbon capture technology and innovation, including common challenges for and advancements in such technology global trends related to the development of IP for CCUS technology, and IP and due diligence considerations for a company's development of an IP portfolio around its CCUS technology. The global demand for energy is growing, and many companies are committed to ensuring a sustainable energy future by developing new technology and innovation around CCUS in an effort to achieve decarbonized global economy while preserving the environment and our world for future generations. CCUS includes a set of technologies that capture up to 90% of emissions from the use of fossil fuels in electricity generation and industrial processes to prevent CO2 emissions from entering the atmosphere. The CO2 emissions can be transported away by pipeline or ship and either stored deep underground in geological formations or convert it into useful commercial products, such as co construction materials, industrial gas and fluids, fuel, polymers, chemicals, new materials, and agriculture and food. Advancements in technology around CCUS have been slowly developing. There are currently 23 CCS projects in construction or operation around the world, specifically in the United States, Canada, Australia, China, and the UAE, and Europe. 
These facilities capture carbon dioxide from sectors such as waste incineration, cement production, iron and steel, hydrogen, gas processing, and power generation facilities. Small-scale pilot plants are in operation. Private industries and technology entrepreneurs are continuing their R&D of new CCUS technology. And global industry consortiums and governmental bodies are collaborating to address the global impact of CO2 emissions on our planet. A number of challenges exist um, that impede the development of implementation of CCUS technology. Um, and many of you uh, attending today are probably very familiar with these common challenges, and I've listed a few here. Uh, the, implement the first is the cost associated with the implementation um, of CCUS technology into existing infrastructure and systems. Because of the potential long-term impact of CO2 emissions, however, we're seeing many companies continue R&D uh, research and development of CCUS technology despite these costs. Another common challenge to CCUS is transportation. There are significant energy and costs required to compress the CO2 gas before transportation and to maintain the high pressure of the compressed gas throughout the, uh, the, the transportation of the gas in the pipeline or other forms of transportation. Another common challenge is the storage of captured carbon dioxide. There's a need for a long-term storage for long-term storage sites to sequester the carbon dioxide without uh, creating um, a situation where there is storage leakage. There's also a potential risk with seismic activity caused by an underground injection of carbon dioxide into geological formations. Another common challenge and one that is uh, more recent is the control systems that are uh, involved with CCUS. Um, systems that are um, adequately and efficiently measuring, monitoring, and verifying the transportation and storage of CCUS, of carbon dioxide. And finally, uh, there is no current technical standard with regards to capturing uh, and storing C uh, carbon dioxide. And therefore, companies are developing technology um, in the absence of those standards. Despite these challenges, over the past decade, there have been numerous advancements in CCUS technology. I've listed a few here, and of course, this is not a comprehensive list of all the technology that's being advanced. However, these are the technology areas that we are seeing um, development and patent filings uh, for CCUS technology. And they include gas separation using sorbents or solvents, membranes and cryogenics, uh, carbon sequestration and absorption, or carbon scrubbing. Uh, synthetic absorbing carbon dioxide from an ambient air. Direct air capture, capture, or DAC. Storage solutions for the captured carbon dioxide and how to maintain the stored carbon dioxide under high pressure. And finally, processes for manufacturing the commercial products that result from using the, the waste carbon dioxide. These next three slides provide a graphical representation of some of the trends of global IP filings around CCUS. You'll see here in this first slide uh, a, a number of a representation, a graphical representation of a number of published patent applications uh, based on the US, Chinese, uh, European, and uh, WIPO uh, patent offices. Um, you will see from this uh, uh, graph that there's been consistent number of filings uh, over the years, specifically from 2012 to 2020. But you'll, what you'll see from these trends is the increase in the representation of uh, filings with regard to carbon capture from China in the orange uh, portion of the bar in relation to the other, um, the other patent offices. This next graphic um, shows the percentage of total publications, published applications, mentioning the keywords air near the keywords capture. And you'll see, uh, as you can tell from here, that there is an increase from about 2015 to 20, 2020 of uh, the number of published applications. And the final graphic that I have um, shows uh, a, a comparison between China, the United States, and global filings 
for uh, carbon, a CCS technology-related patent applications. And you can see from the, the blue line, uh, the, the light blue line, the increase in the past uh, two, two years of, uh, or I'm sorry, from 2014 and 2015, the increase of patent filings by China and a slight uh, decrease or stabilization of filings uh, in the United States, represented by the orange line, and um, uh, and globally by the black line. And we're st we have continued to see this trend grow into 2020 as China and Asia expend more resources for CCUS and other renewable technology. So now I'm going to uh, shift to intellectual property strategies that companies should consider when developing an IP portfolio to protect their technology assets in the CCUS um, area. Intellectual property protection, uh, specifically patent protection, can help facilitate and incentivize commercialization efforts by providing exclusivity for a company. The company's uh, IP management strategy or IP portfolio should include a mixture of patents, um, other areas of IP such as copyrights and trademarks, um, and consideration of using trade secrets. Um, one other area that companies uh, don't spend as much time considering when developing an IP portfolio are the internal uh, IP protocols and practices, which I'll discuss a little bit more further on in the presentation. So the first uh, IP strategy that a company can, should consider is uh, conducting prior art searches, landscape analysis, and freedom to operate opinions. The CCUS landscape um, with, relation, with regards to patent filings is very um, uh, there, there are many patent filings that have been filed um, for CCUS technology over the years. And by conducting a prior art search, conducting a landscape analysis of uh, competitors in the area, um, technology that has been protected via patents, um, can give a company a good sense of uh, where they can focus uh, their patent filings and their patent protection strategy. The second is patent applications, uh, patent application filings prior to public disclosure. Uh, engineers and scientists with each of your companies uh, or, or business uh, corporate representatives will go to trade shows, will meet with clients or customers, um, or may uh, publish articles. Each of those serve as a public disclosure of the technology that you are developing within your company. And it's very important that a patent application be filed prior to that public disclosure so that the ability to file for a patent application is not um, taken away because of that public disclosure. Consideration should be given between filing a provisional or a non-provisional patent application. The provisional application provides the, uh, the, the filer with reduced government fees. It provides them with the ability for a quick filing so that if there is an upcoming public disclosure that uh, the company can uh, quickly and securely protect um, its initial patent provisional rights. Um, and then within a year, for example, in the United States it, or, or internationally, enables that company to uh, secure full uh, patent filing rights. Uh, and that's in the United States. Internationally, a company should consider where they may be manufacturing, using, or selling uh, the technology, or they may have competitors, in determining an international patent strategy. Uh, and that can be protected using the PCT international patent application or direct foreign filings. Now, now, considering the actual patent application, in terms of drafting the claims uh, within the patent application, um, consideration should be given as to the commercial aspects uh, of the technology, what are the unique and novel features of that technology, uh, what competitors are doing in that industry related to that technology. Um, each of these elements contribute to strategy for preparing and drafting the patent claims and the patent disclosure, the patent application claims and disclosure, um, in developing something that, uh, an application that is very broad in scope and provides the broadest scope of protection for that technology. I also recommend uh, within the application including any unpredictable aspects of that technology. Um, in, in many cases, 
uh, arguments may need to be presented during the patent application prosecution to demonstrate to the patent office examiner that the technology, though it may look like or feel like a technology that is similar, that it has unique and unpredictable aspects or elements or composition that is not found in the common prior art. Now, shifting from patents or utility patents, what I was just previously describing, um, companies should also consider the use of design patents. Um, design patents may um, relate to the, the look of or the design of the structure or the apparatus or the system. Um, it may be, relate to the, the color or the, the look and the feel of the uh, technology that's being developed. Uh, copyrights should be considered for manuals, for uh, literature, any marketing uh, brochures that would be used to describe or advertise the technology. And then another important aspect of the portfolio, of course, is the brand. The brand associated not only with your company, uh, with the technology or that specific product, uh, protecting that brand using trademarks. The next area uh, to consider is trade secrets. Trade secrets um, protect proprietary or confidential information um, that is kept within the walls of your company. Uh, trade secrets can be used to protect the proprietary software used in the control systems uh, or in the systems of your CCUS technology. Um, or it may also protect the algorithms that are uh, uh, running or computing processing in the background, um, any, any uh, mathematical computations or any processes that might be running. Um, it's very important for a company, uh, in addition to the patents and trademarks and copyrights and trade secrets, all those IP mechanisms um, to be put in place, to consider what internal policies and protocols and practices they have in place within, a com within the company walls. Um, how is IP, uh, how is technology and information, confidential information and proprietary information, how is it managed? How is it transmitted within the company? How is it transmitted to the company? How is information that may be proprietary or confidential uh, received from other, uh, from suppliers or customers or other competitors, competitors or other parties within the industry? Um, in managing that information within the company, it enables a company to um, leverage the value that comes from that, what I consider knowledge, ass the knowledge assets of a company, and to protect those knowledge assets of other companies uh, for information that they may receive. Um, and finally, the, uh, another mechanism that can be used for the IP strategies is IP collaboration, um, use of patent pools, patent commons, um, to collaborate with other companies, other, uh, governmental agencies to develop technology for the common good. Um, humanitarian or public domain uh, uses of de donating technology uh, for humanitarian purposes uh, or in the public domain. And finally, um, for those of you that are familiar with the software side, um, open innovation and open source. So collaboration and sharing of uh, software code and um, algorithms that may be useful across the board to solve a common common problem. So these are just some of the aspects of uh, intellectual property that you should consider in developing an IP portfolio. I'd be more than happy to speak with um, any of you more about any of these in detail uh, or developing a program. And thank you for your time today and appreciate everyone attending the webinar. Um, please reach out to anyone at Bracewell that you've heard today that uh, you may have further questions uh, for um, or contact any of our colleagues. Thank you so much.